21st Precinct, Sergeant Burns. Where is this? Yeah? Yeah? Well, who is it? His wife? Hitting her with what? Oh. All right, I'll send the officer. You're in the muster room at the 21st Precinct. Who are you? Nerve center. A call is coming through. By transcription, you will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. Okay, the officers will be right there. You wait out in front. Show them what flat it is. Yeah, yeah, out in front. All right. Okay. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of the square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. The weather was unusually mild for the time of the year. At 10.45 p.m., I was on patrol of the precinct in sector car number one. I had instructed the operator of the car, patrolman Charles Lasky, to stop at a garage on First Avenue in the 90s so that I could verify the investigation by Sergeant Waters of an application for a towing car license. While I was inside the garage talking to the night manager, patrolman Lasky entered and informed me that a Signal 30 ambulance responding had been broadcast over the car radio. The address was 710 East 78th Street. We left the garage, got in the car, and made the run. A signal 30 denotes an armed felony, and all patrol cars in the vicinity, regardless of precinct boundaries and other less pressing assignments, are required to respond. As we pulled into the block, I could see two sector cars, the sergeant's car, and an emergency service car were already on the job. A crowd was beginning to gather on the sidewalk in front of 710, a converted brownstone. This is Fartlasky. Pull in. Yes, sir. Hello, Fartlasky. All right. Help him keep the sidewalk clear. Yes, sir. Sergeant. Sergeant Burns. Oh, hello, Captain. What have we got? Have you been up there? Yes, sir. I just came down to call in. Let CB know what it was. Original call was a disturbance. Family fight. All right. Get back off the stoop there. I told you before. There's nothing to see here. The man beating up his wife. Neighbors called in with it. They were making so much noise. Yeah? yeah. Now, I'm not going to tell you again. You got no business here. Now, stay off the stoop. Lasky. Yes, sir. Get on the job here. Keep the sidewalk and the stoop clear. Yes, sir. Clear. Uh, get back All right, there. go ahead. Come on. Thanks. Why uh, signal 30 over a family fight? There's uh, third for Carlin and Hanneman answered the original call. They came in here. The neighbor who called in pointed the way. I could hear the screaming in the hall. They ran up and knocked on the door. Uh -huh. All right, come on. Please. Fight stopped. The occupant, a fellow named Holtz, opened the door. He ran out between them and up the stairs. They chased him up to the roof, collared him just as he was going out the door. Meanwhile, the neighbor phoned in again. Uh -huh. He started to fight them, and they finally got him quieted down, searched him. They found a gun on him. Oh. Uh -huh. They're at that end of the hall. What is he, a psycho? I don't know, Captain. I haven't had much chance to talk to him. There's that door there. Or would you rather go up to the roof? They've... Still got him up there. Oh, well, let's take a look in here first. Huh? That's the wife. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know. All right, take the car number four. Resume patrol. I don't know. He won't hurt you now, Mrs. Holmes. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, we'll take care of him. That's the trouble. What's the trouble? He'll go to jail, and what will I do? How am I going to live? Why don't people mind their own business? Why do they have to call the cops? You ought to be thankful. He could have killed you. It's just an argument, a family argument. But what happened? People had to call it cops. He didn't even touch me. Then what happened to your face? Nothing the matter with my face. He didn't touch me. It's just an argument, that's all. Well, it might have started out as an argument, this host, but uh, it's a little more now. The officers took a gun off of him up on the roof. I don't know why people have to butt in. Always butting in where it isn't any of their business. The neighbors called the cops because they thought he was killing you. He wasn't killing me. It was just a little argument. Likes to argue. Gets a couple of beers in him. He likes to argue. Is uh, this what he was drinking? Doesn't look like beer. He had a couple of beers before he got home. Then he had some of that whiskey here. Wasn't killing me. Where is he? Where's John? They still got him up on the roof. 
What were they doing with him up there? They're talking to him. Waiting till he calms down. He's calm. He was never anything but calm. And the way he keeps coming around here bothering people, he, he's calm. If we didn't come around, Miss Holtz, he might have shot you. He wouldn't shoot me. Not John. He's so butting in. What am I going to do? That's what I'd like to know. What am I going to do with him in jail? Well, what would you do if you were dead? They brought him down, Captain. All right, John. Inside. Uh, just about, Miss Holt. Baby, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right, stay away from her. Stand there, John. I want to talk to my wife. Just stand right there. Where's your coat, John? Stand in the closet. Which closet? Yeah, that one. You see, Annabelle, you see, if you kept your mouth shut, I wouldn't have this. What am I supposed to do, die in silence? All right. Touch her and she hollers. Okay. Touch me. Now, look, this isn't any picnic, John. You're in a big jam. You don't want to go down into the station house with the cuffs on? Calm down. I'm calm. You should have seen him before. All right, Mrs. Holt. I'm calm. You want a hat, too, John? No, I don't need a hat. Good work, Hanneman. Yes, sir. Let's see the gun. Thirty-eight revolver, Captain. Spanish mate. Uh, what were you doing with this, John? I had it. I thought I might need it. Easy coat, John. Put it on. That's not the what I meant. It don't go good with the pants. Nobody will notice the difference. I guess not. What do you think you might need the gun for, John? For protection? Protection around the house? From your wife? From anybody. Are you taking the pinch, gentlemen? Yes. All right. Get him in. Go on, John. Be in the station now, Sergeant. Take him right up to the detectives. Okay. I don't want him to go to jail. Not for hitting me. You can't send him to jail for that. He's in worse trouble than that. The gun, you mean? Yes, the gun. He told you what that was for, just for protection. And while he's carrying the gun, what's supposed to protect everyone else from him? As in all felony cases, the suspect was taken directly to the 21st Detective Squad on the second floor of the station house to be fingerprinted and questioned by detectives under the command of Lieutenant Matt King. Although the investigation was now in the hands of detectives, the prisoner remained in the custody of Patrolman Frank Hanneman, the arresting officer, who would be responsible until he was booked and lodged in a cell. Patrolman Hanneman's platoon was relieved at midnight, but he was obliged to stay with the suspect until the investigation was completed and then appear in felony court in the morning. At 12.45 a.m., I was in my office reading and signing reports when Sergeant Burns on T.S. rang in and told me that Lieutenant King requested that I come upstairs to the 21st squad on an urgent matter. I walked out of my office through the muster room and into the back room where two plainclothesmen from the 6th Division were questioning a suspected policy writer. Then I went upstairs to the second floor and into the detective squad room. Hello, Captain. Hanneman. Listen, can I bum another cigarette off of you? Haven't you smoked enough, John? And don't begrudge me my little pleasure. Here. Much obliged. You know what, Captain? Turns out his name isn't John Holtz at all. It's John Henley. Oh? And they had him down in the 5th Precinct last week on an armed robbery deal. I didn't do it. The victim couldn't identify him, so they had to turn him out. He didn't have the gun there. I didn't do it. And he's done a bit in Sing Sing, Grand Larceny. Isn't that right, John? That's right, yeah. You got a match? Please. You don't have anything, do you? It's a good call, Hanneman. Does Conlon know about his record? No, sir. He went on home at midnight. We didn't hear about this till 15 or 20 minutes ago. Oh, uh, Lieutenant King wanted to see me. Is he, in his, is he in his office? Yes, sir. He's got John's wife in there and a couple of detectives. I don't know what they want with her. Okay. Give me back my matches, John. Come on. Captain Kennelly. Come in, Captain. Hello, Matt. Goldman. Yeah, Captain. Hi, Captain. You met Mrs. Holtz, or Mrs. Henley is over at the scene? We met, yes. What is it, Matt? Goldman and Kirk have been talking to her, Captain. Turns out that when the officers hit the door and John broke and ran to the roof, Conlon took out after him. Hanneman had his hands full with Annabelle. Well, I told you, I didn't like the idea of anybody butting into our business, that's all. We're entitled to have our spots without cops coming in from all over. Annabelle... Patrolman Hanneman, the officer who's outside with your husband now, was busy with you while the other officer chased your husband up to the roof? Well, I was trying to keep him busy. Well, how long was it before Patrolman Hanneman went up to the roof? Him out there with John, you mean? Yes, that's right. A couple of minutes. He took me. And when you and Patrolman Hanneman got up there, what did you see? It was nothing to see. 
John was sitting down there by the side of the wall, and this other cop, the, what's his name? Patrolman Conlon? Yeah, the other one. He was standing there. Did uh, Patrolman Conlon have anything in his hand? You know what he had in his hand. With the gun, he took off John in his hand. Mm-hmm. And then what happened? I don't know. Nothing. And a cop came right away, and they took me back downstairs to the flat. The new ones, one of them. Hanneman and Conlon remained up on the roof with your husband? Yeah. Him out there now and the other one. It's a big idea. I, I don't get it. You don't have to, Annabelle. Hanneman. Yes, sir. Bring John in here a minute. Yes, They did a good job, Captain. Nice collar. I know it was. All right, get in there, John. They treating you all right, baby? Better than you. Sit down over there, John. They want to talk to you, Hanneman. Yes, sir. Goldman, keep your eye on them. Over here, Hanneman. Yes. Okay. Yes. Hanneman, were you present when the gun was taken off of John? Well, were you? I was on the way up. Is it true that Conlon took the gun off his person when you were still down in the hall with the wife? Yes, sir. And how come you took the pinch in this case? It's Conlon's case. We're partners. Everybody splits up the pinches. I know they do when they're both present, but you weren't. Why did you take the pinch? Conlon asked me to. He didn't want to go to court in the morning. Oh, he didn't? No, sir. Well, he will. Matt, uh, is this phone to T.S.? Yes, sir. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Byrne. This is Captain Canelli. Yes, sir. Get out the residence record on Patrolman Conlon. Yes, sir. Notify him to report to the station house forthwith. While we awaited the arrival of Patrolman Conlon from his residence in response to the forthwith... The suspect, John Henleys, was taken downstairs and booked in on charges of felonious assault and violation of Section 1897 Penal Law. I instructed Patrolman Hanneman to report to my office after the prisoner was lodged in a cell. Yes? Patrolman Hanneman, Captain. Come in. Is your prisoner booked and in a cell, Hanneman? Yes, sir. Did Conlon tell you why he didn't want to appear in court tomorrow? No, sir. Was it that he didn't want to appear in this case or didn't want to appear in general? In general, Captain. Uh, before the tour, he asked me if I'd take any pinches tonight. He had something to do tomorrow. What? I don't know, Captain. He asked you to take the pinch, didn't he? Yes, sir, but I've asked him to take pinches on certain nights because I've had something to do the next day. We were over that before. That's perfectly all right when you share in an apprehension. Either one of you could appear. But would you kindly tell me how you could expect to qualify as a competent witness in this case when you couldn't testify of your own knowledge that the defendant was carrying a gun? Well, uh, usually a cop doesn't have to testify at arraignment, Captain. Bail is usually set for a hearing at a later date. Supposing you got into court, supposing John Henley's had his lawyer there, which he will, and supposing John told his lawyer that you weren't the cop who took the gun off him, the lawyer would insist on your testimony. What could you testify to? Nothing. It'd be dismissed then and there. Yes. And it'd be a fine impression for a police officer to make in court, wouldn't it? To appear as the complaining witness in a gun case when you couldn't even say whether he had a gun or not? All I can say, Captain, is that uh, I didn't see any harm in it. It's not a trial or anything. It'd only be an arraignment. Remember this, Hanneman. Without a proper arraignment, there'd never be a trial. Yes. 21st Precinct, Captain Canelli. Sergeant Burns on TS, Captain. Yes? Coleman Conlon's out here at the desk, Captain. He just came in. All right, send him in here. Yes, sir. You've been a good cop, Hanneman. You made a good collar tonight. Don't spoil these things. Do it according to the book, and you won't get in any jams. Yes, sir. Come in. Hello, Frank. Mike? Leave the door open, Conlon. Yes, sir. Hanneman's going out. Yes, sir. You, uh, wait in the back room, Hanneman. Uh, yes, sir. All uh, right. Excuse me, Lieutenant. That's all right. Sorry. I wanted to see you a minute, Captain. Come in, Matt. Yes. Would you shut the door? Well, Conlon, Lieutenant King. Sit down over here, Matt. Thanks. You know why you're here, Conlon? No, sir. I got the fourth with and I came, that's all. You have any idea? No, sir. Well, you should you and Hanneman handled the case tonight. Henley's. Henley's? 
We found out who's was an alias. The name is John Henley. Oh. Yes, sir. Is it correct that you and Henley were alone on the roof when you took the gun off him? Hanneman was down in the hall? Yes, sir. That's correct. It was your case. You were the only competent witness. Why did you ask Hanneman to take the pinch? I wanted to get out of going to court in the morning, Captain. Oh, you did? Yes, sir. That's the job, to go to court. You've been in it long enough to know that, haven't you? Yes, sir, but he's been taking the pinches one night and me the next. He's captain of a bowling team. That's I don't you... care what you thought or what you've done. In this case, Hanneman isn't worth a nickel in court. You're the only one. You knew that, didn't you? Yes, sir. Usually the hearing is set down for another date. What was so urgent to keep you out of court? I was supposed to be in Albany at noon, Captain. And back on the job by the 4 o'clock turnout? No, sir. I'm swinging. Why we are supposed to be in Albany? What's so important there? Personal matter, Captain. It might be personal, but it better be good. My wife, Dan, my kids, my two kids. On a pleasure trip? No, sir. We've been living there for six, seven weeks with my mother-in-law. We've been separated. Oh. I had it patched up. I spoke to her on the phone yesterday. She agreed to come home and try it again. I was going up and driving them home. Well, she knows you've got a job. You could have called her and told her you had to go to court. She'd be there later in the afternoon. No, sir, I couldn't. Why not? That's the reason for all that trouble in the first place. The job. Most of them, anyway. Working nights, being delayed, getting home by going to court. That's how it all started. She said she had enough of it. She's sick of staying alone at night. She wanted me to quit the job. Get into something where my time's a little more my own with, with her brother. She's got a bar and grill and wanted me to come in as a partner, practically. I liked the job. I wanted to stick with it. Well, we broke up. Well, I guess after six or seven weeks, she missed me as much as I missed her and the kids, Captain. I, I called her. I asked her to come home. She said, okay. And I was going. Now, if I called her again and said I couldn't be there on account of the job, she'd probably say, don't come at all. Well, why didn't you tell the captain on the scene over there? You know, he probably could have worked something out. Yes, sir, Lieutenant. I know he probably could have, but I wasn't taking any chances. I thought it would work out okay with Hanneman taking a pinch. But it didn't. No, sir. Now I'm in a jam with her and in a jam with you. All right, Carmen. You'll find Hanneman in the back room. Wait there with him. Yes, sir. Carmen. Yes, sir. Well, never mind. I'll uh, talk to you later. Yes, sir. Carmen. Yes, sir. Come here. Is that next to Sling back there, Sergeant? <laughs> Just a second. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Brand. Lost your what? What the euphonium? Yeah? Yeah? Oh, it's, it's, it's like a tuba, huh? Well, where'd you lose it? What subway? Yeah, I see. Yeah. Well, the first thing I'd suggest that you do is call the transit lost and found. That's Ulster 25000. Ulster. U-L. That's right. Then you come in here and we'll take a lost property report. Yeah, that's right. That's between Lexington and Third. You're welcome. Now, there's a guy with real troubles, Conlon. He lost his euphonium. You ought to be happy he had one to lose. It couldn't be that bad, Conlon. Ah, don't try to cheer me up, Sergeant. All right. You want to suffer. I'll be in the back room. Why first for you, Mr. Burns? All right, you take your meal now. Hi, Frank. What do you say? All right. Yeah. I got us jammed up, didn't I? Ah, it's nothing. Sit down. What do you mean, nothing? If I had any sense, I wouldn't have asked you to take the pinch. You want to smoke? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. So what happened? Well, the guy turned out to be a pretty hot customer. He did some big time, and they think he's right for a couple of armed robberies downtown. Yeah? Yeah, they're tickled to death to have him right on the gun deal. <laughs> they're tickled to death, and I'll probably be up on charges. I'll be right there with you. What could they stick us with? Mm, they'll find something in the rules or in the manual. Or conduct to the prejudice of good order, efficiency, and discipline. That covers everything else. Ah, this is... This is a stinking job. You break your back, and what do you get out of it? Nothing. Besides losing your family. Don't cry on my shoulder, Mike. I'm not the PBA delegate. I'm in the same boat you're in. Mm. Lieutenant King was in there with him. Yeah, he went in as I was going out. Oh, yeah. 
He's probably helping the captain draw the charges and specifications. And I quit a good job on the New York Central to join the cops. Hi, Mike. Frank, what do you think? How you Hi. doing? That's what sure like the job. Yeah, we're married to him. Big deal. If I've got any sense, I'll go into that bar and grill with my brother-in-law. What are they keeping us waiting around here for? Don't they know we've been on the job since four yesterday afternoon? What time is it, two o'clock? Uh, two ten? That's worse. Kind of waiting for us to tell them we're sorry. Maybe they're getting the deputy PC up here to suspend us on the spot. No, no they wouldn't be doing that. That's all I'd need. There you are. You were you put John in jail. They'd keep me upstairs with questions for three hours. Did they tell you you could go home? Yeah, they told me. Cops are supposed to help people. Tell me, what am I going to do with him in jail and back in Sing Sing? Lady, I don't know what you're going to do. As far as I'm concerned, I wish I'd never seen you or John. I wish you lived on the west side. I wish I'd had enough sense to stay in the Coast Guard. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what. Mm. Well, listen, Mike. Yeah. Why did you want me to take the thing? Oh, I, I've got to go up to Albany tomorrow and to bring my wife and kids home. For good? Yeah, I hope for good. <laughs> we got to straighten out. Congratulations. Thanks. Hey, you know, even if we get that 720 more a year, the job isn't worth it. You think they'll give it to us? I don't care. I'll be tending bar in my own store. Oh, what are they waiting for? Suspense. Yeah? That's part of the technique of command. You learn it at Delahanty's. Wear them down by cooling their heels. And even bad news is relief to get. How long was your wife away and the kids? Mm. Six, seven weeks. That's a long time, too. Yeah. That uniform allowance in addition to the 720 a year is a good thing to have. Yeah. Well, that's a bargaining point. I think the PBA would settle for the $720 and let the uniform allowance go by the board. Well, I don't know whether we should. Mike, here they come. Uh-huh. Skipper and Lieutenant King. Bad news. On your feet, Mike. Yes. Hanneman? Yes, sir. Come on back at the cells with us. We want to talk to Henry. Yes, sir. You wait here, Colonel. Yes. Let's go. You been out for a meal yet, man? No, sir. Well, let's walk around to Lexington Avenue after we get this settled and grab a sandwich. Sure, Captain. Go ahead, Hanneman. Yes, sir. The attendant's out for his meal, Captain. Do you want me to go back and get the keys from the desk officer? No, we can talk to him through the bars. There's where we put him. Number three. John. John, wake up. On your feet, John. Come on. What is it? Come here. Even let a guy sleep in peace. John, you told us you did a bit for Grand Lost Name. Yeah, so. The DCI records show you were released in 1951, April. You owe any short time now? Yeah, I owe him a year almost, not quite a year. All right. In addition to the charges you're booked in on, you're being held for parole violation. You'll notify the parole board that you're here when the office opens in the morning. And all you got in your mind? Can I go back to sleep? Do what you want. Okay, let's go. Thanks for the good news. Go ahead. What's the story, Lieutenant? You'll see. I've got a cab. Thanks. Okay. All right, Colin. Yes, sir, Captain. Notify the desk officer that you, instead of Hanneman, are the arresting officer in the case. Yes. Then I do have to go to court in the morning. Is that right, Captain? You go to Albany. You'll be notified when to appear in court. Yes. I'll be in my office, Matt, when you want to go out for that sandwich. Yes, sir. Captain. Yes? What about me? You get out of here, Hanneman. Go on home. Yes. Good night, Captain. Okay, Conlon, you're off a tough spot. 
Next time, do it according to the book, will you? I will, Lieutenant. And thanks, sir. Who's going to take John to court? He's got to go, doesn't he? I really appreciate it, Lieutenant. He's talking to the wrong man, Conlon. Am I? It was the captain who pulled you out of it. He's fixed it so John can be held on a short affidavit. Do they do that? I thought the police officer or a complaining witness had to be injured and unable to appear. They'll do it. The captain got in touch with the DA's office. The assistant on the job told him the magistrate would hold John without arraignment for 48 hours. He appeared to be a parole violator. Also, the captain, as the commanding officer, would appear and make a short affidavit that he had reason to believe the defendant guilty, that the arresting officer was unable to be in court. And the captain's taking him to court. Oh. Have a good trip to Albany, Colin. Yes. Well. (laughs) I guess we're off the hook. Yeah, I guess so. How about the skipper? Is that part of the technique of command? I don't think so, Frank. You don't learn that at Delahazy's. So it goes, around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct transcribed a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly. Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hannah speaking.